Welcome to the Virtual Training Institute. This is day two, and we want to um, say thank you so much for taking your time to um, gain the professional development that our state office is providing over these three days. So <clears throat> you were all muted upon entry, um, but I'd like to point out two features of the GoToWebinar. Um, you can see things that we post into the chat room, but for you to communicate with us, we need you to to use the questions box. So you can send those um, questions to Brianna and I, and we can um, address them as the session gets started. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna kick off this session by sharing a poll. And the poll is just gonna simply ask, what is your role in your program? We'd love to know who we have with us today. All right, it looks like we have an overwhelming majority of ESL instructors and then fairly split between ABE instructors and some program specialists, I'm sorry, program administrators joining us. So thank you. All right, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce the session of Adult ESL and Technology and I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Brianna. Hi, uh, my name is Brianna. I work with Strong City Baltimore and I'll be presenting on adult ESL and technologies and strategies to successfully integrate technology into the classroom. So just a quick overview of what we're going to look at today, the benefits and downsides and some workarounds for the downsides, the various types of technology that can be beneficial to adult ESL students, focusing a little bit more on student autonomy and the benefits that technology can provide for that aspect and how to integrate successfully. So some of the benefits of integrating technology into the adult ESL classroom is that it increases student autonomy, which lets students become more in control of, what, of how they approach learning English as a second language. Um, it provides resources for students to use outside of the classroom, which is always a benefit. It gives you activities to boost student engagement and also a little break for teacher talk time. And it, it helps to test for and work on fluency, grammar, and reading comprehension, um, among other key components of English acqui uh, language acquisition. So these are some of the downsides that I know a lot of teachers find is fitting it into the curriculum and one of the ways that really helps work around that issue is that if you set a, a routine it breaks up the classroom time and instruction time and can provide um, a break for the students. Class time lost to preparation if you introduce it with your con with you in control it helps to limit the amount of time lost in introducing them to the technology. Funding is always a huge issue when it comes to technology and the resources that are available. There are a lot of free resources that can be adjusted to fit your needs, and this includes websites like YouTube. There are many free ESL um, grammar instructions, reviews, and videos that I personally love to use with my students. Students, unfortunately, can become stagnant or reliant on limited technology, and one of the only ways to work around that is to just keep working with technology and showing various ways of using it. Upkeep and maintenance. Websites constantly update and change their websites, or they, they lose the rights to the site. So, unfortunately, that's something that cannot really be worked around at the teacher level. And um, equity and personal access which is something that the, this crisis has shown is a really big issue in education. Finding alternative programs that you can use with uh, phones or tablets without needing too much internet connection. And those are things like apps that we'll talk about later that can you can just usually work around that as well. So the types that I personally like, films and videos like Rachel's English, um, things on YouTube. You can also use TV shows for the film aspects like Friends, 
it provides a lot of commonly used English and students can really work on their language by using captions and listening at the same time. It's a great resource for them. Podcast, which focuses mainly on listening. Um, for that, I have found that Voice of America News and their website has great resources that break down the most current news topics and some of the grammar and um, language covered in them is highlighted at the end. You can do online field trips. Um, one of the great things about that has come up, resources that's come about during this time is that a lot of the museums around the world have made their materials and their um, tours accessible through Google. And that is a great way of introducing cultural aspects of, of um, English and using English that way, having students write about it or taking the tour through Zoom or whatever resources you have for um, virtual classes is great. Um, Zoom, Google Hangouts, Skype, those are great for um, actually holding the, the in-person classes virtually. Some of the apps that I have used for my own language acquisition and love to recommend are Duolingo, which is great for more of a game-like <clears throat> translation, work on um, work, working with language in that aspect. Busu and Memorize have great um, resources when it comes to learning language that's more um, native-like. Memorize especially focuses on how to listen to native speakers. They have great videos of speakers and I've enjoyed it much for my own use trying to work on Spanish. And online games, those are great for continuing to make language learning a fun process. WhatsApp is one of the more commonly used um, communication apps around the world outside of America. And it has a Facebook, it's through Facebook. And I've used it to receive work from students, but you can also use it to set up study groups and assign students to a, a chat when you're there. And it provides a constant line of communication for teachers to students. So that way, when you're outside of the class, like we are now, they're not losing you. And that, that source of communication and um, almost safety net of having access to you during instructional time. And Google Classroom, which is a favorite of mine, it's a virtual classroom that allows you to do many features that would almost mimic a classroom setting, um, like grading and commenting features, which allows the students to receive immediate uh, response and comments on assignments. It also lets you see immediately when students turn them in. Um, it creates a virtual pro portfolio, which helps the, both the teacher and the students maintain um, a certain level of consistency when it comes to learning. And it's also great for privacy. The, the portfolios are private, so it only the, the teacher or owners of the classroom have access to that aspect, which I really appreciate. So um, I'm just gonna talk quickly about student autonomy. Student autonomy, in my opinion, is that it allows the teacher to well, it allows the student to control their learning. It creates an authentic, it helps you create an authentic but understandable way for the students to figure out what type of studying and learning works best for them. And like I said, it allows students to control their own learning environment, which is at the adult level, well, throughout the whole educational process. It's what I think is meant to be the goal when students can actually learn themselves and are able to focus more on how they learn they're more in control so there are five steps to the autom autonomous learning first is just the students being aware of what they know what they don't know what works for them the second is involvement so getting able being able to be more involved in their own education and their own learning process is very important for all levels of education um, intervention means that they can intervene on their own behalf so they can take more control over wait that isn't working for me how can i figure this out creation creating their own ways of, of it working and then trend, and then you want them to overall end up at the transcendence level 
which means that they're able to go beyond what you what you're giving them. They're able to look for the resources themselves or use the resources in a way that fits them best and it has nothing to do with how you've taught them. And um, they're able to use the various electronic sources and um, resources outside of their learning experience. So if they're work, if they're trying to find work, then they can apply what you've taught them when it comes to technology and make it so that, make it applicable to finding a job or various other electronic um, processes. So I'm just going to focus on how and what are the steps to integrating technology. The first thing is it's a routine. You have to, to make a routine for your students so that way it's expected. We do this when it comes to setting up in-class experiences like having, um, they know that we're, it's Monday we're going to do reading or on Thursday we work, we focus more on grammar. So having a routine for how you approach the time being always the same, always the same steps for for technology is really important. Um, you can use it to deliberately, you can integrate it more by deliberately using it in group work and collaboration. So asking students to work together to find, um, to use an electronic dictionary that's not on their phone or finding examples of the verb to be in common use online, which is something that I think is really great. It helps to work more with students and foster their their use of English outside of work or whatever is the minimum that they're doing now. Um, introducing a variety of computer of technology of uh, technological sources such as computer programs like the if their textbook has a website, using their, their book website is great for um, mimicking the, the path that you're, you're teaching them. Cell phones are a great resource, things like just sim for simply their dictionaries that they will use all the time, or um, using it for what, like I mentioned before, WhatsApp, or if you have students from other countries like China, WeChat, where that's what they use to communicate with people more than um, just sending a, a simple text message. And games, there are a lot of games that you can use for all levels of students, especially beginner levels of um, beginner level students when it comes to like word recognition and um, matching the words to images that they will already know of because they've learned them in their first language. Um, you can use the technology to encourage students to continue to learn outside of the class class time and to explore the language. So we know that learning a language is is you continue to learn a language all the time. So even if you're not actually actively learning in the classroom, you can be passively learning and passively absorbing colloquialisms outside when you're shopping or things like Inter, um, interacting with native speakers or hear, overhearing native speakers talk is always, so students are always learning. So if you're encouraging them to use the technology to look up new new things, look up new phrases, say, oh, well, I heard this in the store and I don't know what it means. Well, look it up, see what, see what you can find. It's a great way to give them that control over their own learning experience. And one thing that I always try to do when, when it comes to inter integrating technology is you have to plan for technology to fail. There's always going to be a time when too many people are on the internet or the weather is making the internet connection not stable. You have to be able to work around that. Um, students not knowing how to operate. Many students come to, to an American classroom with access, that has access to tech, more advanced technology than they do, not knowing how to do more than use Facebook to communicate or simply call back home on WhatsApp. So actually having them having a little bit of time in the first the first few weeks of using technology in the classroom, just working on, OK, this is how you do this and setting up the routine for we log in, we remember our passwords um, and then just getting the operational aspect can be a hurdle for some students, but 
it's fairly common that students have some understanding um, of technology, especially when they're coming over here by themselves. They at least know something about being able to communicate with their family, which is a great gateway into working around them not knowing how to use a computer. Um, and for students forgetting passwords and previously covered materials on how to use a computer. Um, just like you would want to review a unit that you covered before, last week when you come in the next week, you want to continuously review some of the basics of using technology in the classroom. And students are going to forget their passwords and their login information just like we do. So it's important to have them write down passwords or use something that is easy for them to remember. But you also want to, after, you want to make sure that, this, that students are understanding that they can't just continue to use the same password. You want them to be good citizens of, to, of um, the internet and make sure that they're aware that, okay, if I use this, this password for everything that's educational, I can't use it for my bank or my Facebook. It will, there's some, there could be a security breach that way. And you want to make sure that you kind of break that down for students in a way that, you know, they're going to understand and be aware of the the dangers of using the same password for everything. But having students write down their, their passwords in their textbook is one of the things that I do. So I have them write down their password and their username in the, the front of their textbook so that way it's there with the login information. And um, if they're bringing their textbook to class like they should be, they'll never forget it how to choose the technology students should use. So you have to be aware of the student language needs um, and what level they're coming to the class with, which you're already kind of aware of it because you're, you're lesson planning. You're differentiating for students based on the book and what you're, what you're instructing them with. So applying that to what technology they choose is really important and kind of carries over in that way. You have to have basic knowledge of students' proficiency. So what, what about the, um, how much do they use the internet in their day-to-day -day use? Do they use it for work? Do they just use it for Facebook or texting uh, family and friends? Does it fit those students' language level? So is it too hard? Just like you would use to choose a book or a textbook that you want them to read, you want to use the same the same resource, same gauging system for the technology and make sure it's not too hard because then they won't do what you want them to do. They'll go to Facebook or they'll just sit there and not do anything. And if you want to also make sure you evaluate the purpose of the technology. So how does this fit into the lesson? Is it going to cover the same topics? Is it related to the unit theme? So maybe you're going to give them the your, the theme you're covering is on health, and you want them to go online and look up what are some of the issues with health in America, cover some of the, the general topics that the book covers, and give them some, some room to explore more about the, the theme and the topic itself. Is it going to help with grammar, fluency, speaking, writing? It's important to, to know why you're choosing to use these resources. Otherwise, the students will not actually learn anything from it and it'll just kind of fall to the end of the importance for them. So one of the things that I like to do is to, the routine that I had with my students was that once a week we would go into the computer lab and work on the book website, which worked with the grammar and the fluency and listening and writing of the, the topics covered in the book. It's a very easy one-to-one. -one. It just kind of fits. But there are other resources like Voice of America um, Learning Language, and it can be something that is more of a review of grammar rather than the grammar that they're going over now, but it's still important that, you, that they cover it and you make sure that they have some understanding of how it's used in day-to-day -day language. So that's just the way that I go about choosing language, the based on the language needs and what I already know of my students, what technology will be a best will be the best fit for them for that week. So I have some examples of 
what I use. I use Google Classroom and later on I'll be showing Khan Academy. So one of the things that I really appreciate about Google Classroom is the organization that it provides for students and for myself. So you see here that I had, I, I, I separate it by the, the day that the class, that the materials will be posted. I have attendance, what the topic is. So unit eight grammar review, then we go over Khan Academy, we have our Zoom class. That is on the, the, the regular stream, but you can also see where it covers all of the topics that we cover in class which is great for, you can click on the date. So if I wanted to go back to April 14th, I just click on that and it goes straight to the day and I can look at the materials I posted, student participation of that day, um, which is great. I can use this as a grade book. So you see here, I had two students who posted or responded with the listening and all of the other students either didn't or they, they sent me a message over WhatsApp or we talked about it on the Zoom class. So it's a way of, of getting grades and resources for me to make sure that they're on par with what I'm giving them, which is I find really convenient. And similarly, Khan Academy, which is a great resource for all levels of education, has a way of, of assessing student progress and the assignments, it shows you just how much of everything they did. If they kind of did okay with it, it gives a score. You can um, assign work for them. Um, and it's, it's just a great resource to have and use for students, especially now when you're just kind of keeping them afloat, afloat and reviewing things with them. And you can assign content by topic. So for, um, my higher intermediate class, I gave them just to kind of get into how to read for certain purposes, second grade reading and vocabulary, but it's for the ELA students. And it gives many resources on how to read a text, what, how to look for evidence. And you can also see the scores of the students there, um, how much work they did. So I really, I really think Khan Academy and Google Classroom work well together by, because they do, keep a track of the student work them for you without you having to badger students. Did you do this? Get it done, which is great. Um, and then just wanna go over how to recognize it. So students are able to independently operate familiar programs and activities. They're able to access the materials at home. So they're not just waiting to do it in class. They're asking for more resources. And this is really important because this helps you kind of realize when students have gone from just doing the work to actually being interested in it and, and in a way transcending the materials that you're giving. They're able to use the applicable knowledge in class time and also outside of class time and work or um, personal life. And the students are able to keep up with work. So when it comes to technology, sometimes students just don't, are not able to. So when I have a student who's able to keep up with the work, keep checking in with me and making sure that, hey, I don't, I can't see this, is it okay? Um, send me a picture of the work instead. They're able to keep up with it, keep track of what they're doing. I find that that is one of the more successful signs of integration of technology into their education at this point. And that's what, I, those are the things that I look for personally in my classes. And that's it. So if you have any questions, I can't see. So. <laughs> okay. no, I can answer some of the questions. Um, it looks like we have a question from Deborah Green. Um, can you share the free ESL video reviews that you like to use? Of course. So in the handout, I actually, um, I believe I linked to a couple of the resources that I like to use for when it comes to videos. So one of them is, um, <clears throat> sorry, Go Natural English. And so she has a lot of videos that help you with using English and understanding English in the real world. Like this first one, Think English. Think in English with, the, with Netflix videos. Um, I personally also like um, Ronnie ESL. She has a lot of, I, I think she's fun. And so when I think a person is fun, usually my students agree. <laughs> and they find the video a lot more engaging 
which is a challenge at this level with adults. You don't want to make something, you don't want to choose a video that's too childish. And then they're like, I don't, I'm not 10. Um, so just for a quick example, Ronnie has a lot of energy and she writes them. It's colorful, so it catches them, their attention. So when it comes to things like that, that's what I, videos, I look for something that's engaging for them. And they're not just not, not interacting with the material. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Um, another question, how about the privacy or FERPA concerns when you deal with students over informal platforms like WhatsApp? That is something that I saw. Um, it's just, I personally just don't look. I'm only, I don't, I try not to um, look at like their personal stories or what they're posting about their, their personal life. So it, it's really, you have to constantly think about, okay, this is not just my social media platform. I'm not just going on here to check in with my friends. So I think it just, it just has to be a thought that you're constantly aware of because it does get a little bit risky if you go to the front page, it's like, oh, well, you can see their stories and what they're posting about their life. And so um, I'm not exactly sure how, to, how else to, to explain that. It's just a, you know, just your personal thought process has to always be, this is only for work. I'm only accessing these students anyway for, to send assignments out. And that's helped me to just actively think about it. I think another good point around that is that um, the students are choosing to engage with you in that way. So mm -hmm. it shifts a little bit of the, the teacher student relationship when they're choosing to engage with you in that way. I mean, certainly that's not a requirement of the class. Yeah, especially now that we've been, we've been doing the distance learning it's really just been for me to, for some students who don't feel as comfortable doing like a Google quiz that has the questions from the book, they'll just take a picture of the book work that they've done and just send it to me. So I don't even use WhatsApp like more than just sending, getting the picture and saying thank you and correcting them. So if you set the boundaries for this is all that I really want, want you to send me or this is why I'm using it. If you have questions, ask, you can message me that way. So it's good for if you don't feel comfortable for student with students having your personal number, I found, because they don't have to have your number. You just have to send them, I think, like a link or some or something, like a you can a QR code or something, I think. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So there's another question about if they sign a waiver um, in your class. I haven't had students sign a waiver. I only use like personal communication, like WhatsApp with one student. And that's just because she feels much more comfortable with, with doing that. Um, and that, and that's, like I said, she just sends me picture of, pictures of the work that she completes. Um, I, I don't, I haven't sent a, had to do the waiver. I'm not sure if, I'm sure it would probably be better if I did, but I don't think that my students would use the my like the contact information that I give them that I feel comfortable giving them for anything other than just asking me keeping asking for questions about updates for when are we going back or I can't see the work on the Google Classroom I'm going to be late that's why so for me personally no I haven't but if you feel like it would be something that would be better for you I think it, it's definitely something that would be a good a good idea. I might have to yeah. think about that for myself. Yeah, I mean, certain institutions are going to have social media policies. So, you know, as with anything, um, before you start using a platform with your students, um, you would want to check with your program administrator to see what kind of restrictions or or leeway you might have in those areas. All right a lot of fantastic feedback so thank you all for attending and brianna thank you so much for sharing your insights um 
such a timely topic right now with, with the way the world is. So yeah. thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Thank you all for taking the time to attend. I've linked the feedback survey in the chat box. This is our second virtual training institute and we are always looking for feedback as to how we can make the next one even better. So thank you so much. Just as a very quick reminder too, all of the resources, handouts, recordings will all be available um, on our website after the Institute. So if you have uh, seen something or missed something that you'd wanna catch up on, you can do it right there. Um, the other part that I will mention is that um, if you are looking for proof of participation for your for your sessions, um, go ahead and wait till you've attended all all the sessions in the three days, and then um, the feedback or I'm sorry the uh, the link for that proof of participation is also on the website, so you can get that if, if you need it. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Brianna, for sharing that excellent information, and we will see you again. We have a three o'clock session today, a five o'clock session, and all day tomorrow. Thank you so much for attending.